this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, by air, President Roosevelt has just announced. The attack also was made on all naval and military activities on the principal island of Oahu. We take you now to Washington. The details are not available. They will be in a few minutes. The White House is now giving out a statement. The attack apparently was made on all naval and on naval and military activities on the principal island of Oahu. The president's brief statement was read to reporters by Stephen Early, the president's secretary. A Japanese attack upon Pearl Harbor naturally would mean war. Such an attack would naturally bring a counterattack, and hostilities of this kind would naturally mean that the president would ask Congress for a declaration of war. There is no doubt from the temper of Congress that such a declaration would be granted. This morning, Secretary Hull talked with the secretaries of war and of the Navy. Now the two special Japanese envoys, Admiral Nomura and Special Envoy Caruso, are, are at the State Department engaged in conference with Secretary of State Hull. Their appearance at the State Department on this Sunday afternoon emphasizes the gravity of the Far Eastern situation where hostilities now seem to be actually opening over the whole South Pacific. And just now comes the word from the president's office that a second air attack has been reported on Army and Navy bases in Manila. Thus, we have official announcements from the White House that Japanese airplanes have attacked Pearl Harbor in Hawaii and have now attacked Army and Navy bases in Manila. We return you now to New York and we'll give you later information as it comes along from the White House. We return you now to New York. Here we go again. Another plane's come over. Looks like we're going to have a night tonight. Get them to our boys. Get them to our boys. Something burning is falling down through the sky. And circling down. There we go. They got one. They got one. We got that one. We got it right here. Did we? Yeah. For this one. Great blots of fire came down in the small ring now, just off our port side in the sea. In less than a week, 326,000 men and 54,000 vehicles were put ashore. Within a month's time, more than a million Allied troops were in France. As the summer wore on, the Battle of France turned into a rout. On August 25, 1944, Paris was liberated. The news of Europe as it occurs. The world is now awaiting the arrival in Berlin of Sir Neville Henderson, British ambassador to Germany, who took off from England's Heston Airdrome nearly three hours ago, flying to Berlin with the British cabinet's answer to German Chancellor Adolf Hitler. Now, during this broadcast period, we shall hear the latest word direct from the two key cities of London and Berlin as our CBS representatives speak to us across the ocean by shortwave radio. First in London, waiting to speak to us now, is the chief of Columbia's European staff, Mr. Edward R. Murrow. And to hear Mr. Murrow, we switch you now to London. This is London. Europe is all paradox these days. For instance, one of the few places in Europe where international railway traffic is undisturbed is the Polish Corridor. Germany's transit arrangements continue to function without a hitch. Trains continue to cross the corridor without a hitch. And Germany is said still to be sending military transport over the line. Now here in London today, the Chinese and Japanese ambassadors called at the Foreign Office. And they called together. And that's something that London hasn't seen for a long while. It's also just been announced that Germans have been instructed to leave Hong Kong. Croydon Airport will be blacked out tonight. And the Admiralty have forbidden the use of wireless transmitting apparatus from any seagoing ship in British territorial waters. And I should not be surprised to see certain steps taken during the next 24 hours to establish what would be called a voluntary censorship over certain other forms of communication. The first defense orders, or decrees, were issued here today. They cover a lot of territory. Power is given to order compulsory evacuation for both people and animals. 
In other words, if the government says go, you've got to go whether you like it or not. Compulsory billeting is provided for. And that means that if you had a house in the country with an extra room, the government might bill it without your consent two or three people in that room. Private premises may be taken over. Traffic on the roads may be regulated. And the carrying of cameras will be prohibited in certain areas. And there's another provision. It states that no person shall have under his control or liberate any racing or homing pigeon. Prices of foods and other commodities may be controlled. And the dispatch from the United Kingdom of material other than that handled by mail may be controlled or stopped altogether. There are more than a hundred separate items in the list, and there will probably be others to follow. Well, those surprising Russians are still handing out surprises. Voroshilov, the war minister, says there's no reason why Russia should not supply the Poles with arms and materials, just as the Americans. And incidentally, the British have been supplying them to Japan for the last two years. The feeling is growing here that the agreement with Russia may, in the end of the day, do Germany more harm than good. We shall probably have more information on that point after the speeches in Moscow tonight. As you know, the House of Commons meets tomorrow at 2.45 London time. And I can tell you that the Prime Minister is being urged very strongly not only to outline the recent exchange between Hitler and the British government, which so far remains a secret, but he has today been urged by certain opposition leaders to tell the whole story of the breakdown of negotiations with the Soviet Union. If he does tell that story, we shall be in for trouble for Parliament. Mr. Chamberlain has been told that Parliament will provide a good sounding board, that a full, complete statement would convince doubters that he has no appetite for personal government and is prepared to defend Britain's action in the open. Of course, what he says will, in large measure, depend whether or not, will, be, will depend upon whether or not he has received Herr Hitler's reply to Britain's message, which Sir Neville Henderson is now taking to Berlin by air. On the whole, I should say that the possibility of avoiding war has not increased during the day. Government circles are, in fact, exceedingly pessimistic. But there is a general belief that the strategic position is improved, that Hitler is hesitating, that the Russians may betray the Germans. You are already aware of the reaction in Tokyo and Madrid as a result of Hitler's retreat to Moscow. We are not yet certain of its full effect in Rome. Italy still has only a quarter of her army under arms. And if war comes and Italy stands with the Germans, she will suffer more terrible havoc than will Germany. There is still hope that Hitler may pause and think again. There is still the possibility of a conference. The people with whom I have talked in London today certainly haven't expressed any optimism, but their spirit is better. They believe the Germans are worried and uncertain, if not frightened, and that's a pleasant situation for most Englishmen. They think, rightly or wrongly, that they now have the initiative, that if war comes, they will win it. But that if we have a conference instead, the result is likely to be only a postponement. That view is reflected in the evening news, which says, what can Britain or France do to prevent war at the last moment, unless Herr Hitler takes some step toward calling off his dogs and agreeing, in the words of President Roosevelt's appeal, to refrain from any positive act of hostility for a reasonable stipulated period. Even if Herr Hitler did so agree, it would but postpone the day of reckoning so long as he is in his present mood, which is that of a wayward child who has never been caught. So far as I can learn, the Poles have not been subjected to pressure by Britain. No one could truthfully say that the alliance with Poland has ever aroused any popular enthusiasm in Britain. Britishers know very little about Poland. The necessary historic and sentimental ties are missing. But the matter is not now so much one of Poland as it is of Britain's pledged word and the determination to move in one direction or the other out of this twilight of peace. Hitler has made his demand. Now he pauses. It is difficult to see how any solution is to be reached on Hitler's terms. That is to say, any solution that would provide anything more than a temporary relief. Now the Queen is returning from Scotland tonight, and the two princesses are remaining there. Everything is being prepared for zero hour. Britain is moving up to the line, and I should be less than truthful if I fail to report that some people see it coming with almost a sense of relief. Those are the people we maintain that the retreat has gone on far too long, and that time and determination are now required. 
And we feel that perhaps war is the only solution. And that the resulting world order will be better than the one we have fumbled with for the past 20 years. I don't know. But the decision must be made. And the folks here seem to think it will be made during the next 36 hours. I return you now to America. That was London and the voice of the chief of Columbia's European staff, Mr. Edward R. Merrill. Now let's hear from the German capital, where high government officials are awaiting the arrival of the returning British ambassador. To hear the chief of Columbia's continental staff, William L. Shirer, we take you now to Berlin. Hello, America. Hello, CBS. This is Berlin. The sands are running fast. Tonight, here in Berlin, we should have a decision whether it's to be peace or war. It's just eight minutes to eight Berlin time, and Sir Neville Henderson, the British ambassador, is due to arrive any minute now from London. A big Mercedes car is waiting for him out at the Tempelhof Airdrome, and will rush him to Herr Hitler's chancellery in the Wilhelmstrasse as soon as he arrives. The outcome of this historic meeting is now in the lap of the gods. Although word has sifted through this afternoon, that the British government cannot accept the demands which Herr Hitler made public last night, namely a return of Danzig and the corridor to Germany. The Wilhelmstrasse, when I left it a few minutes ago, was maintaining silence, preferring to wait until it knew what Ambassador Henderson brought back. The feeling in German government circles on the eve of this crucial meeting is still firm. And the entire press this evening maintains that Germany cannot and will not compromise, that the Reich will not budge an inch from its demands on Poland for the return of Danzig in the corridor. It is not entirely ruled out, of course, that the British answer, which it's believed contains certain counter-proposals, may necessitate a reply. But the tension has become so terrific that it does not seem possible to anyone here that it can long continue, probably not past tonight, without events taking a turn one way or the other, or as the Germans say, so order so. In the meantime, Germany seemed already on a complete war footing today. Housewives stood in lines beginning early this morning to get their ration cards. It was the first time since the war that these cards had made their appearance, and the people who had hardly believed a couple of days ago that war was possible certainly looked grimmer as they stood patiently waiting for their cards.